poll for you to uh, to fill out, give us a sense of who's on the line with us and what you're thinking about. Okay, from our opening poll, it looks like the majority of uh, participants today are local adult basic education administrators, followed by state administrators, practitioners, others, and advocates. So thank you everyone for joining us for this conversation on the WIOA Title II Adult Education and Family Literacy Act proposed rules. I'm Judy Mortrude. I'm the director for the Alliance for Quality Career Pathways at CLASP and a 30-year veteran of adult basic education programming, administration, and policy. I'm thrilled that Jennifer Foster, Deputy Director for Adult Education and Workforce, and State Illinois High School Equivalency Administrator at the Illinois Community College Board, and the hardest working woman in adult basic education is here with me. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you. Welcome. Um, I, I so appreciate being a part of the discussions today. Great. So for the next hour, Jennifer and I are going to share some thoughts with you on the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, WIOA, Title II Proposed Regulations. Under WIOA, which passed last June and goes into effect July 1, with some elements effective July 1, 2016, ABE will have regulatory language for the first time. And part of getting to that regulatory language is going through the proposed rules process and the open comment period, which we are in right now. So we're hoping today to spur you to action, to submitting your own comments, and we also hope you'll share your opinions with us on some of the key issues we'll highlight today. Because we have so many of you on the line, we will take your questions and comments only via the chat box. Additionally, we are recording this webinar and we will post it soon on the clasp.org slash WIOA game plan website. So please do type in your suggestions or questions for Jennifer and I as we go through the slides and we will take as many uh, of your questions as possible as time allows once we get through this, this core material. The Center for Law and Social Policy, or CLASP, works to improve the lives of low-income people by developing and advocating for federal, state, local policies to strengthen families and create pathways to education and work. The CLASP team, after analyzing the WIOA statute last fall, released a, a report called New Opportunities for Low-Income and Low-Skill Adults and Youth. 
It identifies strategies in WIOA that fall into these four buckets, focusing on low-income adults and youth, helping these adults and youth earn while they learn through incumbent worker and transitional job strategies, aligning planning and accountability policies across the core WIOA programs, and expanding proven education and training options to help people both access jobs and advance in careers. I believe that WIOA truly does reflect the innovation that's been happening in the Title II adult basic education world over the past decade and, and represents an opportunity for all of us to do our work better. And a big first step for all of us is understanding what the, what the law says and how to use the language of the law and the language in the proposed regulations to do the kind of work that, that we know matters. Um, the CLASP team right now is in the process of responding to the notice of proposed rulemaking, these five NPRMs, which were released by uh, the Federal Department of Labor and Department of Education, that propose the regulations for WIOA. The CLASP comments will be on our, on our WIOA game plan website for your, your review and hopefully your use soon. Um, so today we have this unique opportunity to have an ABE leader, Jennifer Foster, here to talk through some of the meatiest proposed rules that impact adult basic education and to get your thoughts on comments to these proposed rules. So let me just frame the conversation a little bit. Uh, let me remind you that WIOA, or as we're beginning to hear it called, the Opportunity Act, includes six core programs represented in these four titles under two federal agencies. It adds up to six programs because Title III, Title I, excuse me, Title I has three programs, adult, dislocated, and youth inside of it. Title I falls under the Federal Department of Labor, Employment, and Training Administration. Title II is AFLA, the Adult Education and Family Literacy Act, called various names in, across different states, but uh, I, I always use adult basic education. Title II comes out of the Federal Department of Education, the Office of Career, Technical, and Adult Ed, OCTE. Title III is Employment Services, or wagner Pizer, often thought of as the, the resource room service in the One Stop, or America's Job Centers, or Workforce Centers, whatever uh, brand name you use in your state. And Title IV is Vocational Rehabilitation Services, also run out of the Department of Education. The for five proposed regulation documents were released in April, and for our purposes today, we're going to focus on three of those documents. They're listed on this slide in red by the Regulatory Identification Number, the RIN. So 1830-AA22 is the document from Ed on Title II proposed rules. 1205-AB74 is the joint DOL ed document that focuses on unified and combined planning and so it is of interest to Title II as well as all the other titles and 1205 AB 73 which is a DOL only document but has some really important information for Title II as we will discuss. So these numbers in red here are what you will type into the search box on regulations.gov to both read the proposed regulatory language and, and to get to the page where you will submit your comments. Uh, you can type in your comments, you can upload them in a document. At the end of the webinar today I'll give you a little bit more information about this process, um, but, but what I can say is it's very easy to do and, and it's an open process for everyone to take part in. Uh, on the next series of slides you're going to see these, these red numbers down in the bottom right hand corner and that indicates where the language on the slide came from and again where you will go to comment on this language. Also on the slides that have uh, the proposed rule language, on the header there will be a number that indicates the specific place in each document where the language comes from which is also important for you to include in your comments. So we have to pay attention to these numbers. Um, okay, Jennifer, how did I do? Did I confuse everybody at this point? I think you did very well. I think that uh, there's Good specific information that, uh, and I wanted to also reiterate the importance of uh, adult education and others that are have an interest to make sure that they do uh, comment on on these new um, proposed rules. Great, thank you. Okay, so the first thing I'd like to talk with you about, Jennifer, is this: the purpose of Adult Education and Family Literacy Act, which the proposed regulations say 
is to create a partnership among the federal government, states, and localities to provide on a voluntary basis adult education and literacy activities in order to do A, B, C, and D on this list. Okay. Um, this definition, you know, it retains all the past purposes of AFLA, so nothing went away, but it really adds, it adds two more uh, parts to the definition. It adds uh, B2 for adults who are parents and family members, ABE should lead to sustainable improvements in the economic opportunities for their family. And it adds an expansion to C, uh, expanding from attaining a secondary school diploma to include this idea about transitioning to post-secondary education and training through career pathways. So, so I'd just like your opinion, Jennifer, what do you think of these additions? What's the opportunity? Does anything concern you here? I think that, you know, for adult education, for a long time we've been talking about um, uh, improving the economics uh, opportunities for our families. And so now what, what AFLA does is just put it, it, it's really putting it in writing. I think that was something that was al always uh, the intent, but I think really this really puts it in law so that we don't forget that, that particular focus. I also um, think that we want to make sure that all of our programs um, ensure that our, our students have direct access to career pathways, making sure that that is definitely a part of it. And I know that there have been some questions um, from the, the adult education community what about low-level uh, students and how do low-level students, uh, how do we do ensure that we're going to continue to provide services to those low-level students? And I think that by infusing uh, career awareness at every um, level of, of support, I think what that does is helps, helps all of our students as they move through through the system, the adult education system, the NRS levels, and completing levels, we're starting at the beginning of infusing career pathways along along the way. So whether it's uh, you know NRS level one uh, for ABE or NRS level one for English as a, uh, English language acquisition students, then we make sure that those learners have access to this career um, pathway knowledge and skills as they move forward. Uh, in Illinois, what we've, we've started to do is with our standards, both uh, on the ABE side, uh, side as well as our ELA side, making sure that we are infusing, uh, have aligned our standards with career awareness activities at each level to make sure that each student is getting actually what, what, they, what they need. Great, that's great to hear. And I agree with you. I think this is, is work that um, is, is well underway in the field and, and just is going to be codified by, by this language. So, and I think the soft skills as well, Judy. I mean, that's mm -hmm. one of the things that we've been talking uh, about is so, whether you call them soft skills or essential skills or what, whatever your terminology you use within, within, the, um, it, within your state. Uh, all of these things can be infused within the the program curriculum and 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 standards in order to make sure that everyone has access and is on a path is on a pathway. Great, great. So we're going to get to a little bit more of those workforce prep activities. And I noticed how you threw in that ELA, the new uh, the new ESL. So that's great. We're going to get there mm -hmm. as well. I'm trying to make that transition <laughs> in that language. Yeah, that's perfect. Okay, so um, let's talk a little bit about co-enrollment. So alignment of work across the, the core programs is really one of the big opportunities in WIOA. And on this slide, we have proposed rule language from the DOL only document, if you notice down there with the little red uh, number. This information is from the Title I Youth proposed rules, and it's specifically discussing out-of-school youth um, as we remember, under WIOA, 75% of the local Title I youth funds must be spent on out-of-school youth, and out-of-school youth is defined as 18 to 24-year-olds. 
which is a big change from WIO where only 30% of the Title I youth funds had to be spent on this population. Um, local, you know, it, it's possible that local providers of youth services may be challenged in engaging this population and Title II adult ed can really, can really help because obviously this is a target population for adult basic education services. Uh, and the proposed rules really explain how this can be done through co-enrollment. The, the first language here allows local areas to consider these individuals out of school even if they are accessing adult basic education, Title II services. And, and the second language here talks about uh, concurrent services, services at the same time and hopefully aligned service between Title I youth and Title II adult basic education. Um, Jennifer, what opportunities, what challenges do you see here? Well, I see that there will be great opportunities, and you've already mentioned that we service that population. And um, I think that, you know, one of the things that we try to stress here in Illinois, uh, dating back uh, to probably 2003 when we started looking at um, bridge programs and accelerated type strategies, um, making sure that the programs were equipped with all of these uh, different pieces of development of a bridge program, making sure that you are focused on the the training side and also the employment side. So I think that you know the requirements in terms of co-enrollment really fits in very nicely if you already have a career pathway program established. And I think a lot of these rules go back to many years previous when we did have a a good um, out-of-school um, youth program or or just a youth a summer youth program. Uh, I just so happen to have worked under uh, both the CETA as well as JTPA during those time frames and in, in the summer youth programs and this is I think this co-enrollment philosophy really gives uh, a great boost to um, our adult education programs because what we want to do is make sure that we have the com we know what the commonalities are now. These are the things that exist. So what can adult education provide to the Title I youth that will be uh, that co-enrolled in these activities that will help them to be successful in the future? So the opportunity to accelerate and the opportunity to get them into work-based training, all of those things I think are very important and are things that if we take a look at our adult education programs, some of those things we already provide. But this also gives us the opportunity to uh, obtain other resources from the Title I partners to, to help to uh, develop some of these things and move uh, the students forward. Yeah, great. So from co-enrollment to co-planning, there is also language specifically in the proposed rules about co-planning. The idea that state and local Title II plans will be aligned with the other core programs through either unified or, or combined planning. Uh, and some very specific language about what those, uh, what those plans should do. Jennifer, I know in, in Illinois you've been having regional planning conversations already with partners. Um, can you share with us more about the process and how you think how you think this program alignment might happen? For some time now, I think that you know we've uh, even before sort of the law started, and this is a a good thing for us that we've been having those discussions with our Title I partners. Uh, again, we started back with the Shifting Gears initiative and and looking at a lot of the policies and the, the, the procedures and, to, and, and making sure that we were working together um, in development of common definitions and things. And I think this co-planning for Illinois sort of started back a long time ago and um, has really just kind of progressed uh, to this point. But I, as a part of this local workforce conversation, um, we we have to remember that, especially since the majority of the audience today is made up of local programs, is to make sure that we're studying and looking at the LMI data, the labor market information, because I think this is the one thing that is going to be prevalent in our conversations at the local workforce level. 
um, also making sure um, that we are are in, in tune to what some of those trends are, what some of the employ who some of the employers are, so that we can come back and design our our curriculum to really fit the needs of not only uh, our local workforce boards, but making sure that our students can go into uh, employment that's viable and goes back to your first screen where we were looking at making sure that these are this is employment that helps to the economic promote the economic opportunities for for our students. And so in in Illinois we have been really focused on regional planning, state planning, the local workforce boards. We've had several meetings and and continue to have some already scheduled in the future to work with um, each of our regional areas here in the state. We are just so happened that in our area in our state we had 10 economic we have 10, 10 economic development regions, and that's what we've been working around. We have organized um, local um, seven uh, operational boards uh, or, or uh, committees to, and these committees actually uh, have local participation as a part, local and, and state participation. And the seven areas are the operations, uh, looking at the law and looking at several uh, steps under operations, the governance, some planning, what are some of the policy needs that have to take place, uh, youth uh, performance as well as technology because those are going to be huge areas. Uh, earlier this week we had a meeting working uh, in partnership with the Department of Labor uh, in a sector strategy uh, conversation making sure that we understood at a regional level what were some of the sector strategies that needed to take place. So um, just making sure that you're having a, a good understanding and that at the state level you're working, the locals are working with the state levels if there are any questions because during this time frame when we're talking about co-planning, co we need to make sure that um, we are bringing things to the table that we can help as a part of this planning process. And being a part of the planning process, it's going to be a, a great opportunity for uh, uh, adult ed to share all of its wares and things that they have been able to accomplish uh, over, the, over the years and also currently. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I know that uh, that people have been a little concerned about this this particular language that comes from the Title II ed document. Uh, it's it's specifically about how the state agency, your agency, must put together a process that has local adult basic education providers, those eligible providers, vetting their local plans, their local Title II plans, with the local workforce board plan. Again, around this idea of, of unified planning. Um, Jennifer, again, do you, is there any specificity you'd like to see added to this language? Um, do you think this language is, is workable? Well, <laughs> if, you know, I think that one of the things that we need to note here that it doesn't necessarily, this does not say that uh, the local workforce boards are going to uh, approve, and I think that that has been some of the, the misconceptions there is that the local workforce boards are approving uh, the plan. What they're doing is actually looking at it from an alignment standpoint um, and making sure that, you know, the, the local um, labor market information or the regional labor market information, uh, the focus is still there on what, as a group, that local planning board has put together. And I think that um, making sure that adult education is at the table is going to be the key because if you really understand what is going to be a part of those local plans and that you're there to actually provide input into what that plan actually looks like, then I think the better informed the, the um, adult ed community will be uh, in understanding and submitting those, pro the, those proposals 
for um, making sure that they're actually aligned with the local local plan. So I see that there, um, I'm not going to say that it's all going to be perfect and everything is going to be uh, great, but I think that there is an opportunity here for uh, adult ed to be seated at the table and to provide uh, a lot of input into the process and what is actually uh, a part of that. And I know that that's one of the things that I'm advocating for uh, at, uh, at the state level is to make sure that our locals are informed. In about a week, we will have all of our program uh, directors together to really kind of talk about what's a part of the, the law, especially as it relate to the unified, relates to the unified plan, and making sure that they have all of the things, uh, the tools that they need in order to provide input and to be here as that sound barrier so that we can make sure that if there's information, things are not going the way that are planned, then we can make sure that we step in and, and, and help our locals to kind of navigate the, the process. Yeah, yeah. So you're taking a really proactive approach, and that, that's fantastic. Um, okay, so let's move a little bit uh, away from planning and kind of the bigger picture to, to more of uh, actual changes in practice or language that's describing change in practice. So, Jennifer, you already uh, made this transition for us. E <laughs> English, ESL, English as a Second Language, uh, gets changed in regulatory language and the proposed rules to ELA, to English Language Acquisition. And, and there's a confirmation in the proposed rules that ELA has the same requirements as other parts of, of adult basic education service, namely that it leads to high school equivalency plus, plus post-secondary or employment. The proposed rules explain that this happens through, through A, the use of content standards, and, and you talked about uh, how that's rolling out already in your state, or B, offering support services, or C, being part of a career pathway. Um, this is language that I know, I know that CLASP will be recommending uh, some change to, specifically that those ors seem out of place and, and that these really seem to be ands. These are things that, that uh, all of three of these things go together um, in, in quality ELA programming. Do you have any opinions, Jennifer, you'd want to share on that? I I think that you know all of these things are going to go to to together, but I do think that some um, we probably want to look at you know making sure that some of the language uh, is a little bit broader, especially getting started with the process. I think that um, it may be difficult for some to institute everything, but I I do feel that you know especially a um, having the standards, because we've already started to take a look at our ELA standards and infuse some of the career pathway, career awareness activities, and the transition services or the supportive services aspects as a part. But I think that, you know, there has, this is probably going to happen over a period of, of time for our locals, is, and this is what I've been hearing from just from our, our, our local programs. Um, is that, you know, this is going to take some time. And then what about uh, those language learners that uh, do not have social security numbers and what impact will that have on, on, the, on the outcomes, especially as we're trying to build the career pathways for our ELA learners that may not show up in, our, in the outcome. So these are things that I think that we're going to have to really focus on and make sure that there is a way to not uh, shoot ourselves in the foot in terms of being able to produce the outcomes. Yeah, yeah, good, good points. Okay, this slide has language directly from the law, so this is not uh, language from the um, from one of the proposed rules sections. This is directly from WIOA. It's the career pathway definition from WIOA. Um, career Pathways is mentioned in all three of the proposed rule documents that we're looking at today and, and it's explicitly called out as part of unified and combined planning. And, and while the proposed rules reiterate that career pathway development and implementation uh, is a key purpose of WIOA, it calls out funds to be used for career pathway development, 
Um, class really feels that the rules uh, on operationalizing career pathways between the WIOA titles should be should be more specific. Um, you know, we're, it, it, the end game here is not that career pathways should be a separate program, right? But should instead be a way to bring the titles together. So, so we really feel we need more information on things like identifying and improving career pathway programs. Uh, co-enrollment, uh, reporting in career pathways, braiding funding in career pathways. Um, in fact, uh, our colleagues at National Skills Coalition who posted their comments today uh, included a, a call to strengthen career pathway language in, in regulation. So I've, I've put a suggested uh, a citation there, a place where people might go in and make comments about the need to include more operationalizing language in career pathway. Um, for, for adult basic ed, I think um, more information, particularly on the career pathway elements in letters D and E in this statutory language are, are of really high interest. Um, D describes education offered concurrently and contextually with workforce preparation activities and training for a specific occupation or occupational cluster. Uh, the proposed rules do include language on the strategy, uh, both in the Title I and Title II proposed regulations. Uh, and, and both call out that, that what is explained here in letter D really means the integrated education and training model, which we'll, which we'll look at in the next slide. Um, but e, and E describes the way that, that this kind of education and training is organized, right, to meet the needs of the individual and to accelerate the education and career advancement of a person to the extent practicable. It's this word accelerate uh, that I've heard from many people in the field uh, uh, that is concerning. Um, people are concerned that this language means condensing, means shortening um, education and training programs. Um, but in the in the ABE practice, we know that acceleration happens from education and training done in the manner described in letter D here. Acceleration happens because of concurrent foundational skill building and occupational skill building contextualized to an occupational sector. Acceleration happens because we don't say to a lower skilled person, go learn English, then get your high school equivalency, then prep for college placement exam, then take some developmental math, then you can study for your welding certification. Instead, we, we align that service and that's how we get to uh, acceleration. So that's my, <laughs> that's my career pathway speech, Jennifer. <laughs> I, I, and I certainly agree and that was one of the things that I was going to uh, reiterate is that you know you're looking at uh, acceleration from a different standpoint and how can you build a bridge program or an IBEST bro program or an um, ICAPS program and this that's the terminology that we use in Illinois how can you build that and cut the amount of time that an individual gets to actually employment how can you build uh, concurrently offer some of these things together in order to accelerate the progress and the um, supports for our, our students. Right, right. So we're hoping to, uh, we will definitely be commenting more on that and hoping to get others uh, to comment as well. And one, another thing I wanted to really just kind of talk about, I know that business uh, sometimes talks a lot about you know, we have a need and we have that need right now and sometimes, you know, uh, education doesn't, can't respond in the, in the manner that, that uh, is needed. And so one of the things that I, I see here from, from these definitions is that um, because we have some of those programs, the IBES, ICAPS or bridge programs, this is a great opportunity to show our employers and our businesses that we can do that, you know, we have that opportunity to do that and we need to just make sure that as a part of what uh, ABE, what we do, making sure that uh, we are, we understand some of the needs of our employers as we build the curriculum that we have. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, another new definition, although again not a new practice, adult ed has certainly been innovating in this space for a while and, and we always now going to codify some of this innovation for us, is this definition of integrated education and training. 
the, I really like a lot of the language that's in the proposed rules around this. I've just included some of it on this, on this screen. But IET is defined as composed of these three parts. A, B, and C. Uh, additionally, there is proposed language that these three parts must be balanced proportionally, uh, occur simultaneously, and use occupationally relevant material. Uh, this definition is not as prescriptive as, as perhaps the 50% overlap of team teaching as we find in, in, you know, in, in the Washington State ideal IBEST model. Um, but it really reflects the same sort of principles of co-instruction, that foundational skill building, uh, along with, with, with the occupational training. Um, additionally, there, there's language in the proposed doc, uh, rules that an IET program has a single set of learning objectives uh, that contain all three of these components and that the activities are organized to function cooperatively which means it requires a coordinated syllabus between adult education and occupational education instructors. Um, Jennifer, you mentioned Illinois' ICAPS work. Do you think it's well represented by this definition? Yes, I do. I think it, it is well represented and I know that, you know, just even, you know, through our work with Shifting Gears as well as working with uh, Accelerating Opportunity, uh, Jobs for the Future, we have worked in, uh, with all of the, the participating states in um, making sure that um, what's in this particular language does reflect what we're doing in each of our states. And we do have, uh, with, our states are different, um, and uh, so this language does actually re reflect that. Also, um, in Illinois, we do have, uh, we, in this last year, built a career sort of a career pathway graphic that kind of depicts how an individual would move into each one of these areas. And it's still a, a work in progress, but one of the things that we did intentionally is to label the uh, IET framework as IET and not label it as ICAPS. Because what it is, um, what we want to do is uh, look at other opportunities to fill in uh, for that space. So uh, the integrated education and training may be something, maybe some another program that may be doing something that has that does fit within this definition that can be added to our our wheel uh, in terms of the, our career pathway graphics. So you know we've looked at you know our bridge definition has three different components. All of those components are represented within the definition. So I think it broadens what we can do um, beyond um, just our ICAPS or our I, IBEST models and are able to make sure that it reflects what we need within our individual states. Great, great. So let's look more specifically at letter B here, this workforce prep, because that's a new, again, another new definition uh, for us that's in the regulatory, proposed regulatory language. Um, workforce prep has, uh, again, this is in the Title II proposed rules document, and, and while, again, it's a new definition, it really is defining work that's, that's well underway in adult ed, uh, this digital literacy, um, the, the critical thinking skills, the working with others, the understanding systems, uh, employability skills. Again, I think it's I think it's a very nice definition. Um, I'm sure people will have comments about uh, including other things in there or or shaving some things off. But Jennifer, what hits you about this this definition? I think this definition is really there's a lot uh, as a part of it, but I don't think it is uh, too much in in terms of you know all of the different components that are there. I think that in adult basic education, we're we're uh, a far far ahead of the game than we than we actually think. And I sometimes think that we look at a definition and and we get overwhelmed by just all of the different pieces to it. But I think once we sit down and we take a look and we're doing some of the alignment activities with uh, with standards and also looking at technology skills, critical thinking skills. And all of the gamut. I really think that you know, it this definition does reflect what we're already doing. And some refer to it as soft skills. Some refer to it as essential skills. 
but all of these skills are something that are necessary. Um, within our state, we have been holding, uh, uh, we're developing a strategic plan for workforce education, and a part of that, we had a, an employer panel, and the employer panel talked a lot about the skills that are represented here in this particular definition. And as we look at PIAC, um, uh, the uh, adult literacy uh, survey that was just conducted, uh, all of these things, the, more importantly, the digital literacy is something that did come out of that particular study. And I think that those are things that we're going to have to focus on. Do we have everything that's represented on the list? It's going to vary among states and um, among um, different institutions that deliver adult basic education, but for the most part, I really think that this definition is broad enough that we can um, have the independence of developing different uh, pieces of it. Yeah, I agree, and I, I think it gives us really nice language in, in adult ed to be able to come to the table again with our Title I partners and say, you know, we, we can own this space, we understand this space, we, we you know, this is what we do, uh, and these are indeed workforce prep activities. And I, and I like that, that, that terminology that we can bring to the table, um, and I think that for so long, you know, we have been sort of, uh, uh, think, we think sometimes that we're, we're pushed to the side as adult basic education. But I think that uh, what we have to do is really kind of turn that around and provide, you know, this is what we can offer. This is what we can bring to that, that table. We, we work on the basic academic skills. We do work on critical thinking skills as a part of it. We do have those tech, we do help to develop the technology skills and, and the soft skills and to develop an individual that we hope that will go into the training programs that are, are, are very well equipped um, to then move into training as well as moving into the workforce. And so that's where I think, you know, sometimes we, we slide ourselves that we do have what is necessary in order to be able to communicate with those individuals that are either on our state workforce boards or on our local workforce boards. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Okay, so let's shift now. We've been looking at a couple of things about practice, and let's move to uh, some of the language around performance. So educational level gain is, is still a performance metric under WIOA. Um, in, in Title II, we're all very familiar with the National Reporting System, NRS. That, that test process is still included. Uh, but there's an addition here in uh, C of this uh, regulatory language that we could use credits or Carnegie units to document level gain. Um, we know that, that some states have put alternative high school diploma programs in place and that some of those programs use competency-based education and not, not credits, not Carnegie units. Um, some higher education programs are also using competency-based education. Um, so this is this is one area where I'm sure class will comment about uh, needing to include competency-based uh, education as part of a educational functioning level gain metric. Um, Jennifer, do you have any thoughts about about these? This text. Well, I, yes, I I I think that you know definitely the in terms of competency based, you know that's something that we we are looking at um, here as well as you know credit for prior prior learning within our state. We're looking at this. But I think we have to, you know, in terms of uh, item number C, we have to make sure, you know, how, you know, will it be defined and also, you know, how will it be evaluated? And I do know that other states have, uh, have definitions and have things, that, and that's what it, one of the things I want to encourage, um, not only uh, at the state level, but specifically at the local level, if there are things that, it, have been developed by other programs, by all means, do not, you know, go and, and redevelop something that is already out there. Utilize those resources that are available to you. But I really think that that is going, you know, how will we as a state, at the state level, evaluate those high school um, programs um, in terms of being able to use the credits and as, as well as the Carnegie units? Right, right. 
there's certainly a lot of work behind a lot of these these uh, yes, regulations. <laughs> yes, there are. Okay. So uh, under WIOA, uh, again, performance metrics, Title II is going to share six performance metrics with the other uh, core programs. So this chart is included in the in the proposed rules, and as you can see on this chart, uh, from the joint, this is the DOL Ed uh, joint NPRM. There are a total of 12 scores on which a state will be assessed for the proposed overall state indicator score and the overall state program score criteria that's that's proposed in the in the regulation language. The first six averages on which a state is assessed are the average indicator scores across the core programs. And the second six are averages on which a state uh, averages on which a state is assessed are the average program scores across each of the six indicators. Uh, additionally, there are also individual indicator scores in each of the empty boxes above, and programs have to hit a 50% of their target in those boxes to avoid sanction. So there's just a lot of language around this uh, that people should check out. But overall, you know, it really represents this concept of shared accountability, uh, that, that the Title II performance um, will be one metric, metric number, number seven here, um, among, among 12. And, and Title II will need its other WIOA partners, the other core programs, to be performing well in order to, to achieve the performance goals. Um, so, so big question, Jennifer, how do you see this this shared accountability system impacting practice. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, um, st it's still yet to be determined. I think, uh, I think there's still a lot of things. You know, we're, um, we're in terms of our performance currently. We're evaluated maybe differently by our Title One part than our Title One partners are. But I still think that, you know, there are things that we definitely, when we talk about the unified planning and the, the local workforce boards, there are places that we're all going to have to work together. Um, uh, for example, the measurable skill gains, one of the things that still yet to be determined, we have to make sure that we are conscious of our lower level students as a part and also our uh, language learners that um, may not have that social security number, which you know I brought up earlier as it relates to the employment uh, in the second quarter as well as in the fourth quarter. Um, so we're going to have to really take a look at those areas and also effectiveness in serving employers. Although you know recently within I would say the last five uh, three to five years, we have developed some of the integrated programs and also some of the bridge programs. And I'm just talking from an Illinois uh, an Illinois perspective, is that uh, our effectiveness in serving the employers. We have worked with employers to develop some of the curriculum, but that still remains yet to be seen in terms of how that's going to be defined and what it's actually going to look like. I do know that our Title I partners are f very familiar with that effectiveness, so we're going to have to make sure that uh, our local uh, ABE programs and ELA programs really have that good understanding of what that's going to look like. Um, and you know, one of the things that we've heard as a part of our strategic, um, um, looking at our uh, workforce education strategic plan is, you know, who actually knocks on the doors of those employers. Uh, and, you know, we have our community colleges that have our business and industry centers. We have our Title I partners that also work with business. Our, our local boards and our state boards are, are, are made up of employers, majority employers and, and businesses. So we are really going to have to take a look at this effectiveness and, and serving employers and who, um, and, and and how will that work and, and interchange with what we do in adult basic education? Um, in terms yeah. of the credential attainment, you know, we're not going to be able to get that high school equivalence, uh, equivalent credential attainment un unless that individual either goes into post-secondary education or training or into employment. And so that's why it's going to be 
you know, imperative that we develop some of the bridge programs and the, um, um, the integrated models so that we're able to be better able to meet some of those goals. So there's still some, some I think, some, some challenges from an ABE perspective uh, in terms of the six indicators that we're going to face uh, just as a, an ABE system. But I also see that there are some opportunities here to engage um, with uh, the other core partners in how we actually meet uh, these requirements. Yeah, ab absolutely. And and I know there there uh, it, it, the proposed regulations do make some suggestions on that uh, effectiveness in serving employers. People should go check that out and and respond. Um, with their own ideas on exactly how we could uh, we could gauge that and, and turn that into a performance metric, but I want to look specifically at at uh, four and five here. So these are uh, these are again that credential attainment language that you were just talking about and the and the measurable skill gain. Um, so first in in uh, Indicator number four, you know, there, I think there's been some confusion. I've heard some confusion in the field around this idea that that expands how ABE gets gets credit. Um, making air quotes around that credit for uh, for high school equivalency attainment, uh, but this is essentially this is this is the, the old GD plus model, right? This is um, this is the high school equivalency plus the next step, and and I've heard practitioners react to this with with fear that this means we're not going to be able to serve people who can't get to a high school equivalency within a year, but I think it's really important to note that that number four here says one year after program exit. So as you say, Jennifer, it, this is about designing programs so so that when students do exit, you know, they are well positioned to transition uh, either to a post-secondary credential uh, training program or, or to employment. Um, I think it's also important to, people should should read the post-secondary credential definition in in WIO. It's a very comprehensive definition. It's not uh, necessarily uh, higher education. There are industry recognized credentials, apprenticeship opportunities, other ways to to uh, to be involved in a post-secondary credential training program than than enrolling in college um, specifically. So. So that's one thing I think people should should understand and comment on. Another is um, is this performance metric number five, what what they call in in the regulations or the proposed regulations, measurable skill gain. Um, and and Title II is very familiar with this. This is one area where I think Title One is is well ahead of or Title Two is well ahead of Title One because we have been living in this measurable skill gain space. Uh, for so long uh, through NRS. This is the okay. use of an academic assessment and an educational functioning level gain. Uh, but, but the proposed rules expand the type of documented progress uh, that can be part of, of a program, uh, not only academic, but also technical, occupational, or other forms of documented progress um, such, uh, toward a credential or employment. Um, which which could be very valuable uh, for ABE in in terms of non-academic assessment, um, but I think it's a it's a whole new and sort of uncharted space for the field. Yes, I I, I do agree. I I think that this is an area that we're definitely going to have to, as a system, understand and better define. You know, does that look at are we looking here at Maybe work keys or NCRC is it you know those types of uh, of assessments, um, and I think the key to indicator number four is exit. You know, mm -hmm. an individual exiting the program, and so you know you want to make sure that and that will I think help us to prevent uh, that effect of creaming or trying to get the individuals that are at the highest levels. I really think that, you know, it's it's the the one year after exit and we're working with students and trying to bring them from being from low skill all the way through so that we can get them into uh, the programs that help to combine. I mean, uh, that pro combine both the basic skills as well as the, the technical skill programs. And so I really think for that item number four, that exit is going to be crucial here when we're looking at our students. But I also think that, you know, with with the 
number five, the performance metric, we're, we're really going to have to de, you know, define what that is. And I think it's broad enough that it provides us with um, an opportunity to define it ourselves as a state and working with our, our other core partners in areas that we may not even, as an ABE system, we may not even be aware of that are actually going on. And so I think what it's going to be is more of that shared kind of re responsibility uh, and sh uh, sharing of, of different information in order to make sure that we meet the outcome. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, when you, what, uh, again, Today I've just pulled out a kind of a sampling of some of the language that's in the proposed rules. Uh, there, are, there is a really interesting um, proposed definition for common exit, and they're looking, uh, the agencies are really looking for comment on uh, on this idea of common exit. So if we have co-enrollment, we have uh, people concurrently being served across titles. You know, do we look at uh, exit from one program to another? Do we look at keeping everybody in until they're done? With the, with the entire pathway. Um, I would encourage people to go look for the common exit um, language and, and uh, make some, some comments on that as well. Uh, so I guess finally I just want to say there's some urgency in this process. So the comment period ends uh, on June 15th at 11.59 p.m. And, and you must submit your comments prior to that. Uh, if you go to regulations.gov right now and type in uh, one of these um, numbers, you can you can read the comments that are already posted there. Um, remember to pay attention to which document you need to post your comments on. Uh, remember that CLASP will be posting comments that we are submitting up, up on the WIOA Game Plan website, and, and we certainly welcome your echoing these comments if you agree with them. Um, we have heard uh, and we know from past experience that uh, that even commenting on the parts of the proposed rule language that you like, that you support, is important, as well as asking for modifications. Um, so, so being involved in the process, I think, again, for Title II, it's, it's a whole new world. We haven't had this kind of regulatory language before. Um, so people aren't as familiar with the, with the idea of being involved. And of course, it's been many years since this happened for, uh, for WIOA. For WIA. So and I would also just uh, reiterate that you know this is a great opportunity for all in the the council of the National Council of State Directors of Adult Education will be getting together uh, next week uh, in Atlanta as well as in in um, uh, Denver to have these these uh, discussions about what's going on with it, as it relates to the proposed rulemaking and will also be uh, providing comment as well. So, um, and also in Illinois, we're going to be doing something the first week of June to get ready to provide the comments. So, it's very important that that you you comment in this process. Yeah, that and that's great to know that those uh, state administrators, state adult administ administrators, will be getting together um, because we do have so many local administrators on the call today, and you know people can can have their voices heard up through that process as well if that's uh, you know what they prefer. So that's great. Um, there is a, the final link here on this slide is is. Uh, a recording from uh, Workforce 3.1. They've recorded a webinar that, that really goes, really has a nice step-by-step -step process, a lot more information on the comment uh, submission process. So I would encourage people to look at that too. Um, okay, well, we are down to our, our, last, uh, our last minute here. So uh, I'm just gonna encourage people, if you've been using the chat box during the, um, during our session to, uh, again, share your comments, your thoughts. Um, we will certainly uh, read through all of those. And, and as Jennifer said, she will be at two national meetings next week. And I will be working with CLASP to finalize uh, our, our comments to the proposed rules. So hearing your voices would, would uh, be a, a great help to us. Um, thank you, Jennifer for taking the time from your Illinois work, your national work, to help people understand the WIOA comment process. Um, do you have any final thoughts you'd like to leave us with? I just would say thank you, uh, class, for the opportunity to participate. Um, and uh, for me, I think that you know there are other, uh, certainly a lot of other state directors um, 
that could have been in this spot and I'm, I'm very appreciative to be able to share uh, my insights um, as well as uh, some from the national state directors and so thank you so much and uh, I again encourage everyone to please uh, make comment. Great, great. Thanks. Thank you everyone. Goodbye. Bye-bye.